ബ്രഹ്മാനന്ദം പരമസുഖാദം കേവലം ജ്ഞാനമൂർത്തി നന്ദാത്തീതം ഗഗന സദൃശം തത്വമാശ്യാതിലക്ഷം ഏകം നിത്യം വിമലമാലം സാർവദേശാക്ഷിഭൂതം ഭവാത്തീതം ത്രിഗുണരഹിതം സദ്ഗുരും ത്വം നമാമി I bow to God as Guru. I bow to my Guru in all of you. Why do we bow when we want to express respect for somebody? You know, it's a very, there's a universal and yogic reason for it. The ego is centered in the medulla oblongata. The reason yogis tell you to concentrate here at the point between the eyebrows is that the medulla is the negative pole of the same chakra. This is the positive pole. And when somebody is proud, you see that they, he sort of looks down his nose at people because his muscles draw the head back. So releasing that in all languages, you see that people to express reverence, respect, and so on, they bow. The idea of the bow is I release the tension in the back of my neck and offer myself up to you, to God, to whatever it might be. The truths of yoga... I should say, uh, are all based on, many of them are based on things you and I know just naturally. They say that the energy must come up the spine. All of us know somehow that when we feel good, the energy goes up. We feel a rising of energy when we feel downcast. Even the words we use, downcast, depressed, low, uh, in all languages, it's the same. When you feel... high you say i feel uplifted i feel up i feel high these are universal things people are wiser than they know they just don't know it that's it but we all have within us and yoga doesn't teach you some outrageous thing like um saying that if you want to get god concentrate in your little finger or something they're telling you things that you know you recognize in fact patanjali said that the essence of enlightenment he used the word smriti Smriti, you remember, you're meditating, and all of a sudden you remember that's who you really are. You don't have to, when a person goes into deep yoga and deep concentration and to ecstasy, he doesn't have to sit down and take notes. Now, let's see, let's see. No, 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 no. He says, of course. It could have been millions of years since you'd experienced it, but that superconscious is always there. it's just within the just on the very fringe of your consciousness fringe of your thoughts so when you practice yoga don't think that you're doing something weird it is getting you to know who and what you've always been and who you really are and many other teachings of yoga for example they say that the the uh, uh heart chakra is in the uh, it's not in the physical heart but in the heart chakra the anahat chakra behind the physical heart well many people when they feel love have experienced it here this is universal all truths i remember i was in the yoga teachings they say that uh, calmness emanates and expansion emanates from the uh, chakra back in the neck the, the vishuddha chakra and uh, i was one time singing uh it was um a song of mine called peace i know it was sri ram jay ram um when i sung a few days ago and uh i just about finished when suddenly i felt my energy going into this chakra and i said to the engineer let's do it again he said what do you mean that was perfect i said no there's something else in it i can feel it in my voice because i can feel it in my consciousness and when you sing try to sing with consciousness it's not enough just to sing with words i've heard so many people singing bhajans and mantras with uh, harsh voices om namo narayana that doesn't do any good try to feel that you're singing from your heart it's like bringing energy up through the heart through the cervical through the um, medulla oblongata out through the agya chakra and i've even done this with crowds have them sing the chant let's sing om and then try to feel it here 
see how different the sound is when you actually vibrating in the heart. So when I was singing Sri Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Jai Ram Om, I feel it now in the cervical, but then I did. And uh, it sounded altogether different to me. It would sound different to devotees, but it sounded just the same to the recording engineer. Well, you can understand that. But it was so interesting to me that a friend of mine had a little child, two years old, and he loved that chant. I had a recording of it. And uh, one time his mother was scolding him, and he looked up at her, up at her piteously and said, Sri Ram, Jai Ram, <laughs> as if trying to bring calmness to her because he could feel the calmness. Well, each chakra has a different vibration. And if you are concentrating in the uh, navel chakra, the Manipur chakra, that will give you a more, it'll be more connected with your digestive organs, the lower chakras, the Muladhar and the Swadhisthan. Swadhisthan is connected with sexual desire. Muladhar is just physical. Um, those who live mostly in the lower chakras, you can see it even the way they sit and stand. Their energy is down there. You can see the uplifted energy in the uh, spiritualized person. This is why I think in the Indian dancing where they do a great deal of pounding with their feet, they're in the lower chakras. When you really are uplifted, your energy is going to go more toward the arms. This is inevitable. And uh, this is why it's so sweet to see the Indian expression of approval, yes. Why? Because your energy is up here. And in fact, that's how in Indian dancing they express delight sort of moving the head in that way. Well, all this is by the way. Let me read to you three passages this time from my Guruji's book, Conversations with Yogananda, 106, 107, and 108. The medical doctors, the Master said, have discovered God's laws on a certain level of, cre of reality. Respect them for their knowledge. Don't ignore them. On the other hand, don't lean on them too heavily. If you continue using a crutch when you no longer need it, you'll never develop your own inner strength. One evening he was deploring the fact that during his illness and subsequent seclusion, people had taken to going to doctors every time anything went wrong with them. When I was more actively involved in things, he said, no one went to doctors. They depended more on God. Now that I've been out of things a little bit, I find them going all the time. Learn to rely more on God. He is ever within you, watching over you. And then there was a middle-aged and kindly man who lived for a time at Mount Washington. His name was Carl Frost, and he fell ill. The master agreed that a doctor should be summoned. He also prayed for Carl. Later, when Carl was well enough to get up, he was able to look out the window and wave at the master as the master was going out. The master called back cheer cheerfully, Ha ha, the doctors get all the credit when it is God who heals. And then in 108, speaking of his own illness, you see masters often, will, especially toward the end of their lives, will take on the karma of their disciples in order that the disciples may advance all the more speedily. And he said, speaking of his own illness, when the wisdom dinner from the plate uh, uh, has been eaten from the plate of life, one may break the plate or keep it. It no longer matters. Don't give in to your illness. If you have to go to a doctor, don't go with this thought of, oh, doctor, heal me. Think that God is the real healer. Depend on him. And yes, you have to have common sense. There's a sect in America called Christian Science where they say don't go to doctors. There was a story my master used to love to tell of a woman who was a Christian scientist, and her son came back from school one time saying, Johnny, a friend of his, Johnny's mother uh, is ill. And the Christian Science mother said, you mean she thinks she's ill? And... Uh, so he, the boy came back the next day, and she, the mother said, Well, how is Johnny's mother? Oh, she's, she's worse, mother. Oh, you mean she thinks she's worse. So the third day, she said, Well, 
How is Johnny's mother today? Mother, she thinks she's dead. Well, you know, you have to have common sense. And yet what the Christian scientists do in affirming wellness is a right teaching. It's not wrong. We should, we should always resist the thought, even when you are ill, even when you feel uh, that you need a doctor, okay, call him if you feel that need, but don't say, I am ill. Just say this body's in need of a little help. Always keep yourself resistant to the thought of illness. You'll find that if you do so, that you won't get ill nearly so often. <coughs> Many times I myself have found that I was ill and yet, if I had to do something, many times I've, I've had people say to me, oh, you mustn't give this lecture today. You're, you're just not able to. When I had to give this lecture at Siri Fort in Delhi back in July, I had to come in a wheelchair. I was that ill. I could hardly walk. And people supported me to get into the wheelchair, supported me to get out of the wheelchair. It was my body. I couldn't do anything about that. But I said, I'll be fine. And I, they were pleading with me not to give the talk. What are you going to do? A hall full of people, there were 2,000 people come, and suddenly I don't show up? You know, you can't do that to people. So I stood there for one hour. And you know, afterwards, by putting out my willpower, even though I didn't feel at all strong, suddenly I felt well, and every day since then I got better. But you have to use willpower. Don't give in to it. In this, I don't mean to put down the Christian science teaching because it's a good teaching. It just mustn't be brought to a level of fanaticism. We finally are not this body. Somebody told my guru one time, uh, he, uh, he said, I've cheated St. Peter, that's the man who's supposed to meet you at the gates of the pearly gates of heaven in Christian mythology. Every religion has its mythology, but he said, I've cheated St. Peter Seven times with carrot juice. And my master said, when St. Peter wants you, you can bathe in carrot juice. It won't make any difference. There is a point beyond which affirmation cannot take you. Up to that point, though, it is important. Don't give in. If you have to see a doctor, if you have to take care of your body, sure, you should always use common sense anyway. But at the same time, always remember, you are Atman. I remember something on the floor and was about to eat and I said, no, no, don't touch it, it's been on the ground. On the other hand, if you said Brahman, you can eat it. So we all said, all is Brahman, and then we ate, we could eat it. Um, that doesn't mean that necessarily you should do it when he's not there telling you that. Mind you, his blessings are also there. When you're with a master, you can afford to take risks that you... It's not that you have to be afraid of defilement. If, you're, uh, if you touch an untouchable or something, you've got to go home and take a bath. That's nonsense. But B, remember that true purity is in the heart. To want only God, to love only God, to love God in all. That's the true purity. The other purity of being born a Brahmin or whatever, you can't be born a Brahmin in that way. Who your parents are is not who you are. You can be a shudra born of a parent uh, of parents of uh, Brahmins. It's not who this is. What the Gita it says, uh, itself says, you are not a Brahmin just because you're born into a Brahmin family or a Brahmin when you act like a Brahmin, think like a Brahmin. When a true Brahmin sees all things, a dog, a cow, a saint, uh, an unclean person, all is Brahman. When you can live with that, then you have understood who you are. That system is not a bad system. Again, as I said with Christian science, it's not a bad teaching. It's a good one. It just shouldn't be overdone. And the caste system, although it's been uh, excoriated all over the world and many modern Indians just won't have anything to do with it, there is a lot of truth in it. It comes down from the times of Manu. How can you say the caste system is wrong? But it doesn't come from heredity. That's the point. My parents were definitely not Brahmins. Maybe my mother was, but my father wasn't. Very honorable, very truthful. 
but not at all spiritual. You are who you are in yourself, and you've got to get born somewhere, for God's sake. So, you are a Brahmin, or a Shudra, or a Vaishya, or a Kshatriya, according to what your consciousness is. And if you are a truly devoted devotee and you meditate deeply, remember what it says again in the Gita, one who meditates deeply, regularly, even the worst of sinners comes to me. So don't think about, oh, I'm this or I'm that. Be that in yourself. But the beautiful thing about the caste system is that it shows you the direction you should grow. You don't grow by becoming richer. You don't go grow by becoming an emperor. You don't grow by becoming a pop star or something or other. You grow if you become more aware that this is not this body is not what you're using, not what you're looking for. It's not your true self. A shudra is one who works but doesn't think very much. A true shudra. A, a saint might be a, a farmer. That doesn't make any difference. A true shudra is one who is born with that consciousness. A vaishya is not necessarily a businessman. I've known saintly businessmen. Rajashi Janakananda, Yogananda's most advanced disciple, was a businessman, but he thought only of God. No, the truth is, are you like a merchant? And mind you, in ancient India, the culture was a lot more sophisticated than just having farmers and laborers and merchants and warriors and priests. <laughs> it was much more complex than that. But the farmer or the worker symbolizes, it epitomizes somebody who doesn't work with his brains, he works just with his body. The Vajra is just an epitome. The, mer the merchant epitomizes someone who works thinking of me, my own, my gain, I and mine. Then he begins to understand that he's happier when he uses some of his wealth for other people, and so gradually he comes up to the level of a Kshatriya. And a Kshatriya is idealized in the form of a soldier in this sense. A warrior is willing even to give up his own body for the protection of his people. One who sacrifices his life for others is a true Kshatriya, even if his sacrifice is on other levels. And a true Brahmin is one who, having realized that I can't even help others because it's God that I'm helping in God. God is serving God. And he sees God everywhere. He becomes the true Brahmin, and only he, a true saint, is a true Brahmin. Live in this world without fear. Live in this world without thinking of anything except, I am here to know God. I am here to love him. I am here to become one with him. In that spirit, let me sing this song to you. No green summer fade and winter draw near. My Lord, in your presence, I live without fear. Through tempest, through snows, through turbulent tide, the touch of your hand is my strength and my guide. I ask for no Yeah.